So uh, let me just put this, uh, this well-being framework in a little bit of context. Um, I did not come up with the seven domains of well-being that we use. They came out in 2005. And uh, the world's largest culture change organization, the Eden Alternative, gave a grant to 10 specialists in the US to go beyond the usual quality measures that we have in aged care and to say, what is deeper? What are things that everybody needs that we maybe don't measure very well or maybe have trouble measuring? And uh, this included some Eden people, like Eden founder Bill Thomas or their first executive director, Nancy Fox, uh, Sandy Ransom. But it also included some other people who've done a lot of work in re reframing aged care who were not necessarily part of Eden, like Joe Angelelli, uh, Vivian and Mary Tellis Nyack, and people like that. So they came up with these seven domains of well-being uh, that you have seen. What I did, because my publisher was after me to write a second book, I mentioned them briefly in the first book and just in an offhand comment said, maybe this should be our ultimate outcome. And then when I, they were after me a few years later to write something else, I said, well, maybe I'll just take that framework and I'll look at dementia through the lens of those seven different domains. So the pyramid, I didn't invent the domains, the pyramid is mine. And, and I want to explain that just a little bit here. Um, the pyramid is not meant to suggest that some aspects of well-being are more important than others. And it also uh, isn't meant to suggest that well-being for us only flows in one direction. We can do something meaningful which can feed into our, our identity. It can go in a lot of different directions. But this was meant to be a way to help you support people living with dementia who may have had erosion of their well-being. And if you are going to help enhance well-being, I do think that there's an order we should think about. And I think if you want to help restore well-being to a person who may have lost some, it's important to know them and to have a relationship with them. So in this pyramid, I put identity and connectedness at the bottom, at the base, because that to me is the foundation of any kind of uh, holistic or person-centered approach is the deep knowing and the relationship. And then when you have that knowing, when you have familiarity, trust, then you can build a sense of security. You can negotiate risk to enable autonomy. And then that can lead you to do things that are truly meaningful or purposeful. That can help you grow as a person. And all of that can lead to joy or joy can stand alone all by itself. Um, I did change the order from the original. Um, and part of the reason was that this is really, this is getting a little bit tougher out there. Meaning is a little tough and growth, growth is really tough. There are a lot of people out there that believe that older people can't grow. And there are really a lot of people out there that believe that people living with dementia or some progressive condition cannot grow. That it's all about loss and all about going like this over time. And uh, in the original, uh, as, as uh, Debbie indicated, in the original ordering of the well-being domains, the first one was identity, the second one was growth. And when I first read this paper, I said, oh, you know, I can't, if I'm talking about something people haven't talked about, like well-being, I can't throw growth out there so soon. <laughs> You've got to understand well-being a little bit more before you can imagine the growth of people living with dementia. And uh, so I put it up higher on the pyramid, and that's why I say I think there is a sequence where one of them, one level, enhances the level above it when it is strong. So it's like a building, and that the foundation is strong, then the upper floors can be strong. But if the foundation gets wobbly, you know how a building is in the wind. The top sways a lot more than the bottom. So meaning and growth are kind of higher self-actualization types of outcomes, but they also can be very strongly affected by problems at the lower levels. So if you don't have a good sense of identity, connectedness, autonomy, et cetera, it can make meaning and growth very difficult. So as we talk about what challenges meaning and growth, we'll talk about that as well. So um, this is apparently what I just said. I'm learning these slides as we go. Um, and by the way, uh, I did send AWA a copy, a PDF copy of this. So if you see things, there's a lot of slides here. Don't, don't write furiously. I'm sure that we can get uh, you know, Karis or Jason or someone to um, send these out to you. Um, I'm going to stay over here. I usually wander, but I don't really know what I'm saying. Here's a couple quotes I used in my book about meaning. Um, the first one from Viktor Frankl is who you know, uh, and, and it really came up with a whole style of psychotherapy where people look for meaning in their experience and, and even in their suffering. And he said, those who have a why to live can live with or can uh, bear with almost any how. And Viktor Frankl knew that better than anybody because he was put in two different concentration camps during World War II, and he saw that the people that could attach purpose even to their great suffering were the most likely to survive. And then the other one, my friend Wendy Lusbader, who's written, if you haven't read her stuff, she's written amazing books about aging, and she has a wonderful book called Counting on Kindness, The Dilemmas of Dependency, and she talks about how difficult it is to find meaning when you're dependent on others. And she said, being of use makes being of need easier, and I think that's another uh, great quote.
So what are threats to meaning if you live with dementia? Well, there's several. The bottom, once again, looking at, at identity, stigmas and myths. If you truly believe a person with dementia is fading away, that they can't grow, they can't learn, they can't make decisions, it's very hard to engage that person in meaningful or purposeful life. Uh, we tend to use scales that measure people that are very reductionistic. We say, can you spell world backwards and can you draw a figure? We don't ask people, can you play the piano or can you read to a child or can you give comfort to a person in need? So because we have this view, we tend to see people in a very uh, one-dimensional sense and we tend to expect less of them. And we focus on those losses instead of uh, focusing on what people can do. Um, society tends to put a lot, of, uh, a lot of weight and value in people who do more. We are a doing-based society. And uh, we always ask people, what do you do? We even do lunch nowadays. It's not even, a, not even a, an experience anymore. It's an activity. And, uh, and, and I'll get to that a little bit more when I talk about activity paradigms, too. Uh, and people, of course, living with dementia and many older people uh, do less visibly. And so they are often valued less. Um, dependency can be a threat to meaning, once again, if you have to have others do for you and you can't as easily do for others. Disruptive relationships. So once again, we talked about the isolation. Bill talked about the isolation that happens when you live with dementia or when you care from some, for somebody who lives with dementia. There's kind of like that dual stigma where, where people who are uncomfortable or who have the stigmas isolate you and exclude you from other things. There's also operational ways to disrupt relationships. So if you live in residential care or home care where the people who provide your care are constantly rotated, though those relationships are constantly disrupted. And when you think about it, what would be a crueler joke to play on a person with memory loss than to constantly send new people in there for them to get to know and to trust when they take their clothes off? It, it's something that's standard in aged care, and yet when you think about it, it's about the worst thing you could do to somebody is, if you really wanted to be a sadist and torture somebody with memory loss, you'd rotate your staff, right? Because that, that makes it hardest for people to trust and to feel comfortable. Um, I talked a lot about this last year, all or none thinking and surplus safety. We had autonomy for our theme last year. So when you have too much focus on security, you often sacrifice quality of life. And uh, so last year I talked about negotiating choice versus risk in dementia. And then the last thing I have here are the therapy paradigms. And once again, we have heard from many presenters today the values of activity, very important. And, and Joy talked about how personally designed engagement can be very be meaningful for people. Unfortunately, and this is where I challenge things a bit, a lot of our traditional activity paradigms don't follow that. And this is where we've had to challenge the way we provide engagement for people. And I do want to spend some time with that. So, you know, we, have, we actually have a certification in the, in the U.S., TR, Therapeutic Recreation Specialists. And um, they are taught, really, to work on what's wrong with people. It's sort of traditional therapy. Let's try to make a bad thing and make it, and make it better. And I'm, I'm not saying that's a bad thing to do, but what we do is we tend to focus exclusively on those types of paradigms when it comes to activities. So my friend Jennifer Carson, who was trained in TR, once said, traditional activities service the illness, which is often what happens. Uh, and my uh, colleague, Daniela Greenwood, from on the East Coast, from Melbourne, uh, said something at our operational planning retreat in Canada a couple weeks ago. Um, very striking to me, the biggest risk to rights is the system that measures success as continued medical or functional improvement. Now, I want to clarify this, and I think I can speak for Dan, too. I'm not saying that functional or medical improvement is a bad thing. I'm not saying therapy is a bad thing. As a matter of fact, uh, Dan and I are helping co-write a book with our friend, Dr. Mary Radnofsky. Mary was the first person living with dementia to address the United Nations about recognizing the rights of people with dementia uh, in their charter for the rights of people with disabilities. And so Mary uh, and Dan and I are helping Mary write a book about how you can support people with dementia looked at through the lens of the Convention for the Rights of People with Disabilities. And I just wrote a section, a, a draft of a chapter about activity, talking about the importance of not abandoning therapy for people with dementia, that people can improve their balance, their stamina, their cognitive function uh, can improve. But unfortunately, we're in a system that only measures what you do and stops giving you help if you don't make what they consider to be a valuable improvement. And that's where we get in trouble. And so we have physical therapy and occupational therapy, and then we get into music therapy and pet therapy. And Danielle heard of somebody who was doing bibliotherapy, which was a reading group. Um, I've heard of dignity therapy. And you start to wonder, why does everything have to be a therapy to be legitimate? Um, it's because we have a reimbursement system that tells us that's all that's valuable. 
And unless we can code it that way and measure these certain functional improvements, it doesn't have value. So I do want to move away from that in a moment and talk about what's bigger than just doing traditional therapy. And the other thing is that we often, you know, the TR training in US and Canada is look at a reductionistic scale like the global deterioration scale and score people and then there's certain activities that certain people should have based on their cognitive score. Once again, not really looking at the whole person. What I wrote in Dementia Beyond Disease about that idea was suppose Jim and Betty both achieved the same score on, for example, Riceberg's Global Deterioration Scale. Does that mean they should be engaged in the same activities? What if Jim is a married farmer with six children who loves baseball and hiking? Baseball, sorry, I'm US. Um, and Betty is a single retired teacher who loves jigsaw puzzles and mystery novels. Does the fact that they have the same cognitive score mean that they will be equally served by the activities recommended for people at that level? So we really have to think about the individual and, uh, and not just look at numbers that really are very gross descriptions of what people are able to do. I should mention that Danielle Greenwood is not really somebody who spends much time caring about sport. But what I understood, because she was, uh, I was with her in Canada two Fridays ago, is that everybody has an AFL team, whether you like sport or not. And she has been rooting all her, I'm sorry, I can't say that I'm in Australia. She has been cheering all her life for Richmond. And so you can imagine what a wonderful Saturday she had when she found that actually she paid a lot of money for streaming and then the internet broke down in the hotel. And she was like screaming with the people on the phone. Uh, so anyway, and the other thing about traditional activity, it's often organization driven, not person directed. So the activity professional may decide what's a good activity, but may not really solicit the individual preferences, needs of the people who are being served. So um, here's a quote by Bartlett and O'Connor from this wonderful book, Broadening the Dementia Debate. In the dementia debate, occupation is usually quite narrowly defined and discussed only in terms of its psychosocial or therapeutic value. Moreover, the tendency in the field has been to create and speak of artificial environments. Think, for example, about how outings for residents are often conceptualized as meeting care needs rather than providing opportunities for people to access facilities that they're entitled to use, for example, museums, libraries, et cetera, et cetera. So um, just once again, to think that there's more than just correcting deficits. There's more than just traditional therapy. So let me ask you a question. Let's just talk about leisure. Let's talk about the things you do that are restorative to you when you have some free time, when you want to get away from the usual grind, or maybe simple pleasures, things that just give you pleasure that might even be very small things in the moment. Uh, just yell out a few favorite leisure pursuits. Somebody? I'm sorry? Uh, tell me. OK, Rogaine is a, is a balding treatment in the US, so I wasn't quite <laughs> sure what you were saying there. OK, yeah, now I got it. Yes, Rogaine, OK. What else do see people say? Fishing? OK, great. Gardening? Golf? Reading, being with a dog, music, music. Walking, on walking on the beach. It's starting to sound like one of those dating sites, long walks <laughs> on the beach. <laughs> Quiet nights by the fireside. Yeah. Okay, good. It's a good example. I just wanted to get a few examples so we can see. So these things, uh, as I said in, in the book, I don't uh, play the guitar to improve my dexterity. Uh, I don't go for a walk in the woods to improve my strength and stamina. It may do that, which is great, but that's not why I do it. I don't uh, try to learn a new foreign language, you know, because it's cognitive stimulation. I mean, once again, that's a great thing to do if you want to keep your brain active. But I do it because I'm interested in engaging in a different culture, and, and it helps me to do that when I can learn a few words. So there's more to it than just the therapeutic benefit, and we have to think beyond that. Now, the Murray Alzheimer's Research and Education Program in Canada has been world leaders in doing action research in partnership with people living with dementia in Canada and the US. And they, Sherry Dupuy and Jennifer Carson and uh, some of their colleagues, uh, did a study several years ago now where they asked 200 people in the US and Canada, what are those things you enjoy doing that give you fulfillment? And then why? What are the characteristics of those activities? And so if I were to take the time to kind of dig deeper into what you told me, why do you do it, what do you like? They came up with seven categories. These are people living with dementia. Being me, being with, as in with others, or with anything, the invisible or the visible. Uh, seeking freedom, finding balance, making a difference, growing and developing, 
having fun. Do those seven things look familiar to you at all? I got really excited when I first read this paper. I said, holy cow, I can draw lines to identity, connectedness, autonomy, security, meaning growth and joy in that, in that order. So, uh, you know, it doesn't matter whether you use Kip Woods indicators or Nolan's census framework or Eden's well-being domains, there's never a well-being framework I'm aware of that was actually validated by people living with dementia. And here is a well-being framework, in my mind, which lines up very well with the domains that you're using at this conference. So to me, this shows that just because you have dementia doesn't mean that these things aren't important. I would even argue, because we are so quick to take away from people with a diagnosis, because uh, people often wonder, what is my purpose anymore now that I have this progressive illness and society has kind of put me in a box? I would argue that while all of us struggle to find meaning and purpose in our daily life, that it is actually a bigger, more acute struggle for people living with dementia, maybe more important to find that sense of purpose. My dear friend, the late Dr. Richard Taylor, used to ask people in aged care, why did you get out of bed this morning? And he would despair that too many people couldn't answer that question. I got up because the nurse got me up because it was time for breakfast. Um, what are you going to accomplish today? I don't know. Um, so we really have to work on this because meaning is so important to life. As someone said this morning, it really is a part of life. So what are some things we should think about when we talk about activity? Well, is it pre-programmed or is it organic, growing from the people who are participating? Does it just focus on doing or does it bring being aspects into it? Is it person-directed versus staff-directed? Is it specialty-driven versus more universal? There's a tied in to daily life. One way to have meaning is to contribute to life in the home in a visible way. Is it tied into people's past, their values, their strengths? And I talk about this to feel versus to be. I often hear people say, we need to give something in our residential care home, something to do so they can feel useful. But to me, saying we want you to feel useful is a little deceptive. I say, find activities that actually help people to be useful. And that, when somebody's living with dementia, that can take a little thinking. It's not always that easy to do. But if you try hard enough, everybody can contribute in some material way. And we'll talk about some ways you can do that. The simplest way for people that can't do a lot is just to ask people's advice and input. While you're providing a service, while you're providing care, ask somebody, what do you think? Is this OK? A shower can be a whole series of questions. Are you comfortable? Is the water warm enough? Would you like it warmer? What would you like to do first? It doesn't take any more time, but it takes the person from being an it, as Bill said, and turns them into the person who is very much directing, and as uh, someone said this morning, doing with, not just doing to or doing for. And um, so very important that the basic, sometimes the basic empowerment for people is just asking people, what do you think? Is this OK? Give me your advice. Um, understanding people's uniqueness. So there's more meaning if you do something that speaks to people's uniqueness. If you do the generic drive-by uh, activity, then people aren't going to feel much meaning in that because that doesn't really speak to who they are. Bring in the being aspects. That's where most of us reside when we're really having true soulful moments, as uh, Sean talked about this morning. And focus on the moment, because that's where people living with dementia, particularly um, that have more struggles with memory, that's where people reside, is in that moment. Activities with visible contributing outcomes, being versus feeling useful. Volunteering, mentoring, I'm gonna give you some examples of these. Um, intergenerational engagement, or other opportunities for people to give care. So, uh, you know, we talked about the, the, the folks, uh, Mandy and Sue talked about working with an elementary school and giving kids the chance to be with uh, older adults. But it could be gardening, it could be care caring for pets, it could be doing anything where you are helping others. Um, turning routines into rituals, I'll come back to that, and supporting a sense of agency, which I defined in the book as the ability to affect your destiny. Um, Rituals are different than routines. Routines are a series of steps. So there may be a bathing routine. There may be a routine for changing a dressing. And those are important. But to give meaning to any activity, you need to make it into a ritual. And rituals have certain characteristics. First of all, usually when people join a ritual, there's some sort of welcoming. They're greeted as valued participants. Everybody is engaged and included. No matter what their abilities, everybody is part of the ritual. There's a tie-in to each individual's personal history and their values, traditions. There's flexibility to accommodate different paces, different abilities, 
different needs. It's not just about one size fits all. And relationships are central in going through those steps. So whereas routines are based on tasks, rituals are based on relationships. And then uh, two other things, the experience is more important than the result, it's being versus doing. And then there is some sort of thanks and appreciation and closing for what happens. So I often challenge people in residential care to take all the routines they have and think of all the ways you can make more of a ritual out of them. How do you take a meal and not just make it calories and nutrition, but a mealtime experience? How do you take a bath? How do you take getting somebody ready for bed at night? How do you take the celebration of birthdays or death? How do you bring rituals into these to create more meaning every day? for people's lives. I got some stories about meaning. Let's see how we're doing here. Oh, we're doing OK. I talk fast, so that helps. I'll give you a couple of these. Um, I don't think Tara made it today, Tara Stringfellow. One of the great things that Alzheimer's WA is doing is uh, they've had a grant. I met Tara back, I think, in 2011 at ADI uh, when she came to Toronto to speak about this grant, where they are identifying people with dementia in the community and connecting them with a volunteer opportunity. So when society is saying, you're fading away, you're sick, you've got a fatal disease, they're saying, Come volunteer. You, you've got gifts that your community needs. Uh, it keeps people engaged. And I truly believe that when we can really measure these things, we're going to find that this actually slows uh, the progression of disability for people to be able to have a purposeful uh, involvement. I'm going to tell this story because I try to tell it better practice every time. And I always get cut off before I have time to finish. So I'll tell it today in case I can't tell it on Thursday. Um, my friend Court Nygaard is a psychologist down in Tennessee. And he often goes to see people in assisted living and residential care. And he was asked to see a gentleman, actually a guy without dementia, but it really taught me something. And um, this man had laid floors for a living, but he got arthritis. He became disabled, couldn't work, then eventually couldn't live alone, and moved into this assistive living community. And people were doing things for him, and he was depressed. He was feeling useless. So Court went to see him, and he was talking to him. And the man said, I just I need a purpose. I feel so useless. And Court, trying to be a helpful person, said, well, uh, I'll bet they need some help folding laundry in the basement. Uh, would you like to help with that? And he said, no, that's busy work. I want something meaningful. So Court, being very wise, stopped suggesting things. And he said, you tell me, what would be a meaningful job for you to do here? And the man thought about it for a second, and he said, I want you to give me a job to do where if I screw it up, something bad happens. <laughs> now, if you're working in residential aged care, or if you're one of your great auditors, you might not enjoy that kind of a response. But I thought about that. It really was an epiphany for me, because you know, you never have a sense of accomplishment if it's failure free. Even a five-year-old will give up if you let them win all the time. And uh, the only reason we feel good about what we've done is because we could have failed, but we did well. And that's where the accomplishment comes from. That's where meaning comes from. And so the answer is not how we provide failure-free activities. The answer is how do we provide engagement and activities where people can safely fail from time to time so that there's actually some accomplishment when you come through it. Um, what else can I talk about here? The folks at Merup, uh, the folks living with dementia who work with Merup, actually have a set of guides called By Us For Us. And you can get them, download them for free on the internet. Just Google it, By Us For Us. And they're a series of about a dozen, and they keep adding more, maybe 15 different pamphlets about coping skills, self-management skills by people with dementia for other people with dementia. So they talk about how you can deal with different challenges from what they've learned. And it's really a peer support network of giving information to people, just like uh, you know the beautiful stuff that Diane was talking about this morning that she has done. That idea with the photographs just blew me away, going down the street. And even thinking to turn around and take them backwards, because that's the way you're going to go home. You're not going to go this way. And you know I probably would have done that wrong five times before I figured it out. But, um, but you know that would be a bias for us guide. You know, how to find your way in a city. Maybe you should talk to Merritt. Maybe you could write that for them. They'd probably love it. Um, at St. John's home, when they had the big tsunami in northern Japan, when I worked at St. John's, we talked about what, what could we do for people at, 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 in Japan. There were people in aged care that had gotten basically knocked out of their nursing home because half of it had been washed away. And um, somebody said, well, we should, just, uh, we should fold some cranes because that's sort of a universal sign of peace and unity. And somebody said, yeah, it's supposed to be good luck if you fold 1,000 cranes. And you know, we had people that said, oh, you know, pe what people need in northern Japan is they need money. They need food, they need shelter, they need construction. And we said, yeah, but you know what? People living in residential care in the US can't provide any of that stuff. But they can provide support and unity. And you couldn't always do it by yourself. Those cranes are not easy to fold, I learned. But we put two pairs of hands together, 
folding them. And we got people living with dementia, people in aged care, workers from all different departments, and we got together and we folded 1,000 cranes and sent them to them. And my friend Emmy Kiyota, uh, who I'll talk about in a minute, a design specialist who I, I've worked with, um, took them, took the box to the people, and we saw pictures of people opening this box and saw the tears streaming down their faces when they saw the people living in aged care thousands of kilometers away had made them these cranes to tell them they were thinking of them. And these people shared a lot of history. They shared a war, a big war, where they weren't necessarily friends. They shared loss. They shared all kinds of things. So these are elders and elders connecting on a level that the rest of us couldn't do. Mission View in San Luis Obispo, California, the only uh, residential care home in the United States which is also registered as a nonprofit charity. It began with a therapy activity. It began with people deciding to make soaps, nice, colorful, scented soaps for an activity. And when they made it, they said, what should we do with this? And they said, well, why don't we sell them and raise some money? So they took them to a local market, and they sold the soaps, and they made money. And then somebody said, what should we do with the money? Somebody said, well, maybe we should donate it to somebody needy, maybe a homeless shelter. So they started making soaps, selling them, and donating them to the homeless shelter. And then somebody who lived there said, I'd love to see the people that this money is going to. So they went and they helped serve a meal at the homeless shelter. And another epiphany, one of the uh, women who lived at the home was ladling soup to the homeless. And a man took the bowl of soup and said, thank you. And she said, since I moved into residential care, this is the first time anyone has said thank you to me. I'm saying thank you to people doing for me. Now I've done for somebody else. Then it just exploded. They just come up with new things to do. They're doing this charity. They're doing that charity. They're, and and, and they're, just, they're just generating things. And once the ideas start flowing, you never stop. A woman saw somebody come out of one of her neighbor's rooms who she didn't recognize. Asked that person, who are you? And she said, I'm a hospice aide. And she said, what's that? And she said, when people are dying and they have hospice services, I come as a companion. I sit with them. And the woman who was a resident there said, could I do that too? And she became trained. And she's a hospice aide in her own home for the people who live with her. So, so many things you can do with all levels of ability to create meaning. Let's talk now about growth for a minute. Here's some more quotes. I love this one by Grace Murray Hooper. A ship in port is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. Uh, so there's that safety versus autonomy thing again. Uh, and then following that, what Gail Sheehy said, if we don't change, we don't grow. If we don't grow, we're not really living. Growth demands a temporary surrender of security. Um, the Eden Alternative, of which I'm very familiar, has 10 guiding principles. And principle number nine, among other things, says you cannot separate human life from human growth. Everybody who is alive has capacity to grow in some way. And if you stop growing, you stop living. Even if your body hasn't died, you stop living in many ways. And then Deepak Chopra said, well-being changes as we move throughout life which is why a child's version of it cannot be the same as an adult's. We'll come back to that one in a moment. So what are challenges to growth? Well, stigma, once again, you can't grow, you have dementia, you're fading away. Uh, the biomedical view, and my friend Dr. Nader Shabahangi said this amazing thing, which I put in my book. He was uh, writing a forward to a book he was editing. The world is seen through the lens of the data it demands. Much like the person who's lost his keys in the dark and tries to find them only in the illuminated spaces, so we've created a world in which we stop looking for the immeasurable exactly because it's not measurable. So a CAT scan can tell you a lot of things about the brain, but there's a lot of things it cannot tell you about the person. But we have systems that only look at the things we can measure, and so we miss so much. There's the self-fulfilling prophecy. Self-fulfilling prophecy is very simple. I expect less of you. I don't provide an environment where you can do more. You don't do more, and that fulfills my expectation that you couldn't do it. We see it with children in school. We see it with people of different genders or different ethnicities, and we certainly see it with older people and people with dementia as well. Uh, these self-fulfilling prophecies happen all the time, and they're clinical too. Like, for instance, the expectation that people in long-term care and people with uh, dementia will become incontinent. So if they begin having problems with their incontinence, they get pads and they get changed. When studies show that the vast majority of people who are being padded with bladder training could remain continent, we give up and we just use the pads because they have dementia. So now they're incontinent. We do a lot of these self-fulfilling prophecies uh, throughout. Um, staging, staging is kind of a, something I avoid doing because once again, it says, oh, if you have stage four Alzheimer's, you're gonna act like this. No, you're not. 
they're trends, but we're, I mean, that's as bad as any stereotype of any kind of group of people you can think about. Oh, they're all like this. They're all like that. You have to know the individual, not the stage, because everybody uh, experiences this differently. And then to get back to Deepak Chopra, the idea of retrogenesis and infantilization of people, the idea that people become children again. That's a very dangerous thing because a person who's lived for 70 years, 80 years, who's experienced education, marriage, intimacy, childbirth, loss, that person will never see the world like a five-year-old. I don't care what they're able to do or not do. They will never experience bathing from a, an assistant like a five-year-old will. They will never experience anything around them like that. So we have to be very careful. I was very moved, actually, for a different reason. Ilsa showed that picture this morning, and she put it with Christine Bryden's story about how she's a continuum. And I think what the picture was meant to show with the old woman there and the camera showing the infant was that people see themselves as a continuum from infancy to old age. But what I saw when I saw that picture is, here's somebody who's looking at an old person and seeing them like a child. And that, to me, was a caution to see that picture, because that's where we can really get in trouble. Um, and once again, palliative care, hospice care is very important. I strongly believe that many people in with dementia, a hospital is not a good place to be. Uh, aggressive, invasive treatments are often not a good idea for people with dementia. So I think that palliative clinical approaches can be very important. What I'm concerned about is the palliative social approach. I think there are too many people who say the best way to care for somebody with dementia is just to keep them comfortable and happy and secure. But you don't grow if you don't get challenged a little bit. And so I think we also have to think about how we can continue to stimulate people, continue to challenge them to experience new things, to be more maybe than they uh, could before. I see we're running down on time a little bit. Um, so how can we enhance growth? Well, first of all, reduce, re resist those reductionistic views. Don't just see people for stages or for very coarse abilities. Support meaning in other domains. So growth is a really hard one to visualize. How do you help somebody with dementia grow? So I tell people, if you're stuck on this one, if you can't make a list for filling the glass on growth, fill the other five before it. And when you fill them, that person will grow, whether you have anything written under growth or not. If you fill identity, connect, and security, autonomy, and meaning, you will see growth. You don't have to worry about coming up with a separate list if it's too hard to imagine. Um, engaging creativity. We just talked about dance. We've talked about music. We've talked about art. Uh, the creative forces are incredible in people living with dementia. And I, I love the name. I'm blocking on exactly what you call it. But basically, the implication is there are no rules to creativity, right? Creativity has no bounds. It's all good. And when you, when you um, live with dementia, where some of those memories or skills may be difficult, it's important to be engaged in things where you don't have to be right or wrong, where you don't have to get a score for what you do. And what's better than creativity for that? Spirituality, I've given both spirituality and design a bit of a short shrift because I knew that Ilsa would be here, I knew that Debbie would be here, and uh, there's so much to talk about, I knew they'd cover it well. Um, but obviously, spirituality for me and growth is incredibly, incredibly important and purposeful roles. And then I'm going to get to one design aspect, because as I mentioned, I worked with my friend, Dr. Emmy Kyoto, who's a brilliant environmental gerontologist. She and I had a really horrible experience. We had to spend a month together on Lake Como in Italy, pursuing a, a fellowship in a 15th century <laughs> villa. Um, really tough. But one of the things that Emmy taught me is a Japanese concept called wabi-sabi. And that means, according to Emmy's translation, embrace imperfection gracefully. So when we design living areas, when we design spaces for activity, maybe a day center or something, think about this. If you try to design everything that the person needs ahead of time, you have created an institution. It doesn't matter how pretty it is. You don't know the people. You don't know how they want to live, how they want to engage in that space. As, uh, as um, Debbie said through Steve Jobs, uh, design is also about, you know, not just, not just the, what's happening, but what, what you're doing within that space. So create some possibility, create some flexibility in any space so that things can go in a different direction if that's the way people want to use the space. And the same thing with activities, create flexibility so people can go in a certain direction. And that's why things like the time slips approach are so powerful because they do give you that flexibility and it's the, it's the improvisation rule of uh, everybody's right, yes and, instead of no or but. Um, 
Kate had a very amazing story. If you've met Kate Swaffer, and I met Kate Swaffer about three years ago. I didn't know this till I heard her speak last November. And um, she um, apparently was diagnosed with dementia in 2008 because she hadn't acquired dyslexia. She had trouble saying words. She reversed letters, and she see traffic lights upside down and that kind of thing. And it was during that workup she was found to have frontotemporal dementia with aphasia. Now, I've heard Kate speak in the past three years, and she's spoken to WHO and ADI, and she's a brilliant speaker. And I, as a doctor, couldn't sit there and say, this person has aphasia or dyslexia. Well, when Kate was diagnosed and after she got over the initial shock and decided she was going to fight for everything she could, she went to get speech therapy. And guess what the medical system taught her? Sorry, it's not covered. Dementia is not a qualifying condition because it's not remediable. You can't have speech therapy paid for. Now, to Kate's great luck, her neighbor was a speech pathologist, and Kate had the resources to pay her to give her private speech therapy. Now Kate speaks around the world. So people that think that you can't get better because you have dementia are really missing something. And that's why I say I'm not, I'm not totally dissing therapy or trying to improve, because I do believe that if we gave people with dementia, as Kate would say, the same chance to stabilize or improve that we give people with strokes or brain injuries or Parkinson's, there's no telling what we might do. Um, Let's see, we're getting a little bit short here, so I think I'm just going to jump down to Dr. Rogers. Dr. Lemuel Rogers, and his, he and his family, have, uh, everybody who moved into our greenhouse home said, yeah, you can tell our story, you can use our names. Dr. Rogers I knew as a med student because he was a well-known obstetrician gynecologist in Rochester. He's African-American, and he worked back in the early days when there weren't many African-American physicians in Rochester, and he worked in the inner city and would often provide obstetric care for people that couldn't afford to pay him. He did a great service to the community. He and his wife eventually uh, were diagnosed with Alzheimer's, came to St. John's home where I worked uh, to live, and uh, both had a pretty steady progression of disabilities as a result of their Alzheimer's. Um, we were building two greenhouse homes, a small house model that has been designed in the US. 10 people per house, each person gets a private room, nothing institutional. Open access kitchen, communal dining table, no nursing station, no med cars. It's just very much a normal home. And the people that are the carers are actually empowered and versatile. They cook, they, they uh, provide basic activities, basic home maintenance, and they basically run the house with the people who live there. So we built two of these houses, with 10 people in each, people with and without dementia living together. And Dr. Rogers and his wife, you know, a year before when we started talking about this and broke ground, were on the list. They both had severe uh, changes with their dementia at this point, and Dr. Rogers' wife actually passed away. And after that happened, he began to, to uh, decline even more steadily. He went on to hospice himself. And it came time to move the first people into the greenhouse homes in March of 2012. And so we went to his family and we said, we know he's on the list, we know you love this model, but he's really in rough shape now. Do you want to move him from his current living environment at such a critical point in his life? And his daughter said, if he lives one day, we want him to experience a different model. Now, St. John's Home is a good place, but it still has some of those institutional operational trappings that it's hard to get rid of sometimes. Well, we moved him to the greenhouse and Dr. Rogers did pass away. Um, he passed away three and a half years later, long off of hospice. He'd been taken off of hospice eight months later and continued to uh, engage. When I uh, first saw him, there was no response. There was no recognition when he lived at the home. When he moved to the greenhouse, I would come in to visit. I'd bring my guitar to play. He would wave, he'd say hi, he'd sing along with the songs. And uh, I'm going to finish the talk by showing a couple pictures of him. But before I do, I just want to mention Ed Voris. I'll use this as a closing quote and then a couple pictures. And then I think we might have a few minutes left, I hope, Gail. Um, and um, Ed Voris also, here's a wonderful book. You want to read a great book? My friend, Dr. Nader Shabahangi, who's on your right there, and Dr. Patrick Fox wrote a book with Ed, who's in the middle. Ed's been living for years with uh, younger onset Alzheimer's. And he wrote a book several years ago called Conversations with Ed in which he talks about living positively with Alzheimer's. And it's basically a conversation. He and Nader and Patrick talk. And it's just, just like a script of a, of a play. And you read their conversation, but they go deep into all the societal views and stigmas around dementia. And he talks about his story, powerful stories in there. But I put this in my book, uh, I think, under the growth chapter, because it was so beautiful. Ed said, as it does for many human beings, the concept of death invokes both anxiety and resolve in me. 
Anxiety because death is the ultimate unknown. Resolve because finitude can be the greatest benefactor of the life we lead on earth. Far from experiencing a time of fear and doubt, I feel privileged to be able to use my life to possibly make a contribution. No money, just life used for all of us. Can it get any better than this? Once again, as you get closer to the end of your life, as you become diagnosed with incurable conditions, meaning and growth become more important, not less important. And we have to not take our eye off the ball when it comes to that. Otherwise, we end up losing by 48 points. I had to say that. OK. Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, Got to be, you know, got to be loyal to my friends. So here's Dr. Rogers, you know, a year, two years after he came on hospice unresponsive. On the left, helping school children uh, put seedlings into pots. On the right, receiving a commendation from the mayor for his service to the community. Um, if you had seen him before he moved, you would not have realized that this was the same person that he would even, even be there. So um, thanks for your time. Uh, we have a few minutes. I would love to hear a meaning or growth story from some of you. If you have questions, that's great, but the stories are great, too. Thanks very much, everybody. Anyone? You just want to get to break, don't you? Yes, thank you. Can I just have you stand up? It'll just help you project a little bit. Maybe I'll do the, I'll do the Sean thing here, give myself some exercise. There we go. Um, my mom has... Uh, was living with dementia, I was looking after her in the community. Um, her social activities, etc., was much reduced. She eventually went into care and the growth in her socially, my mum would never go and have happy hour or um, go to bingo and stuff like that. She grew, she learned, she did um, that happy hour stuff, she did the the connection between the the other um, residents, and it just it was my it was her heaven on earth uh -huh. that nursing home. Oh, I, thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, um, sorry I didn't get your name. You're flipped over, there. Jenny. 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 Okay, Jenny mentions two things that are important points to me. Uh, number one is that um, we don't we we change over time. Do we all do or like exactly the same things we used to do or like? Not exactly. And when you have dementia, it's okay to change too. It's okay to not do something you always used to do and to try something new and different. That's one thing that's great. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, you know, residential care gets a lot of uh, bad rap. But for people who have become isolated or withdrawn in their home, residential care can be a blessing for a lot of people because it brings you, if, if it's the right kind of place that sees this the right way and can engage you in meaningful ways, it can be, it can be a, a huge blessing for everybody. And people often come to me, friends or family member, who are struggling with a loved one who's at home and they don't seem to be doing well. And they, they're always, the question I always get is, is it time for residential care? <laughs> like I know, you know? But what I usually say is, look at those domains of well-being. If you find those domains of well-being are being seriously eroded in that living environment, or if you're relying on potentially dangerous medications because those well-being domains are being eroded, that might mean it's time for a new living environment. And maybe, to me, the well-being is as good a guide to somebody's uh, uh, ability to, to cope as, as anything else. Uh, other stories people would like to share? Oh, yes, thank you. Similar situation to, Je yeah. similar situation to Jenny. Um, but my mother won't engage with other people. Mm -hmm. um, how do you encourage that? Yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe that's, maybe that's <laughs> the way she is. And there, there, may be a couple things, you know, there may be a couple things going on. Uh, if, if somebody lives with dementia, first of all, there can be a lot of fear. You know, what's going to happen? Am I going to do something that, that embarrasses me? Am I going to forget? Um, uh, so it's a lot of it's cr about creating a space that's really comfortable. I'm just talking to Althea, who talked about this. Uh, you're the one who's telling me, right? You did this thing where you, you didn't set up an activity. You just went in and you started doing some painting. And you let people come in. And if people didn't come in, you go to someone's room and say, would you like to do this? And if they said no, you say, okay, well, I'm going to be doing this. Do you know anybody else uh, in the neighborhood who might want to do it? And they would suggest people. And they'd say, yeah, let's go get so-and-so. She'd love to paint. And so once again, that's a way to do it. The other thing I'll mention is uh, Jane Verity from Dementia Care Australia says, try turning a question into an invitation. Questions engender a lot of concern. Will it, what's it going to be like? I'm safe in my room. Do I really want to go out there? But if you say, you know, uh, Althea, I'm here to invite you to be part of this gathering. I would love it if you would be my guest. Sometimes that little bit of self-esteem 
puts a little bit more security uh, with people too. And once again, you know, we talk about spontaneity and variety and Eden, I'm gonna go off in this direction too because I think it kind of connects to this. We say, you know, well, spontaneity, spontaneity and variety is supposed to be good. Variety is the spice of life. But when you live with dementia, sometimes order and predictability is good too, right? That's what Bill talked about was, was order this morning. Um, so when, how do you know what's good? And when people ask me that, I look at the domain of security. When people are in a place where they don't have a lot of security, that's not the time for surprises. In the shower naked, no surprises, okay? But when you're sitting in a place where you're comfortable, in your room or in the lounge, relaxed, enjoying yourself, then if a child comes bursting in the room or a dog comes running in or something unexpected happens, you have a much better chance of being part of it. So look at the person's sense of security and maybe things you can do to increase security. So just going with somebody. If I go to a party where I don't know anybody versus going to a party where somebody I know is gonna be there, I'm gonna feel a lot more comfortable about that too. So anything you can do to boost that domain of security and maybe the bit of, about autonomy as well, hopefully will help, help with engagement, okay? Other um, questions, how are we doing, Gail? What's that? Oh, we got lots of time. I could tell more stories. What else you got? Anybody else have a story? Yes, okay, thank you. Sarah. Yeah, hello. Um, hi. Hi, Sarah. Uh, <laughs> I had a gentleman, I work in aged care, and I had a gentleman who would just socially withdraw, be in his room, stop signs all over the place, didn't talk to anyone. Um, and I found out that he was a surfer, and I'm a surfer as well, so I thought, oh, I'll talk about the conditions and how the surf was and everything. And he'd actually start to answer questions and talk back. I thought, okay, this is good. Then I asked him if he wanted to wax up a surfboard with me, um, and he actually walked... 30 metres outside on his suggestion, sat with me, waxed up a surfboard and reminisced for an hour about his favourite spots he liked to surf, um, what kind of waves he liked and the joy on his face was amazing. So I was pretty stoked uh, for that. Great story. <laughs> so once again, how do you accommodate people's interests to their abilities? He didn't go surfing, but he did all the things that he used to do. And, and kinetic things, touch things, just like music or art or dance, they can, they can help you reminisce, they can help release memories, they can help uh, improve speech. So by engaging him in something he loved, to the extent he was able to, you were, Sarah was able to really have a, a, great, a great environment. Um, when I think about that type of engagement, when I think about people that sometimes don't come out of their rooms, uh, one of the stories I didn't tell up there was told to me by somebody in one of my seminars who does consulting among several residential care homes in the Midwest US. And she was, uh, went to one group and asked somebody, is there anyone that's concerning to you? And they talked about this guy who they said was just really mean or nasty. He never came out of his room. He would eat in his room. He wouldn't participate in any activities. He was always rude, uh, you know, yelling at, striking at, at the various uh, carers. And it was just very difficult. And so she just went and she sat and talked to the man for 15 minutes. And she came back out and she said, well, what do you know about him? And they said, I don't know, he's just, he's just nasty and he's got dementia. And she said, did you know that he was an engineer? And they said, no. And she said, did you know that he was an engineer who worked for the Disney Corporation and he helped design the It's a Small World ride at Disneyland? She said, no, didn't know that. Well, she asked him about his life and that's what he told her. She said, why don't you talk to him about it? So one of the activity professionals went and talked to him about it got him excited about it, got him to come out and tell everybody else in an activity about his life working for Disney. The maintenance guys would bring him out on their rounds and because they knew he's an engineer and they'd say, hey, you wanna come supervise? We're gonna, we're, you know, we're gonna fix something over here. And he started joining them on rounds. And next thing you knew, this guy's demeanor totally changed. He was out, he was participating. He was uh, you know, loving and loved by everybody. And just because someone took the time to get to know something about him and to ask about him. So once again, pretty powerful things. Wow, time for one last story? Yes. Oh, not from me, from you. Oh, from me. <laughs> from me. Oh, my God. What else? Hang on. Let me go back. Someone? Let me see which other ones I skipped over here. I can't remember what I didn't say. Oops, now I can't do it. Oh. <laughs> yes, how does that feel? Um, growth. Uh, I'll, I'll just tell you this. If you... Uh, if you um, if you uh, see the documentary Alive Inside, which talks about uh, the Music and Memory Project that Dan Cohen started in the US and follows him around trying to bring personalized music to people. Another example of growth. You see people that can't remember, they have trouble speaking after they listen to music that is pre-picked to be uh, music that was important in their lives. It triggers their memories, their ability to speak. 
Uh, it's pretty amazing what you can see. And once again, you can see this with all different types of creative expression. But um, just one more example, and I think probably you haven't raised your hands, but a lot of you have seen this with all the different kinds of engagement you've brought about. Uh, I go to a massage therapy. She says that sometimes people with aphasia speak better during a massage, remember more during a massage. Um, so any kind of engagement like this can really bring up all those sleeping brain cells that are there, that are working perfectly well, but we don't normally use them. And because our usual engagement bangs on the same broken circuits like conversation or rote memory, we think people can't do it. And it's not until you get through all those back doors by engaging the different parts of the brain that you start to realize that the brain still has billions of perfectly working connections, even in people with very severe uh, changes with dementia. And if you can find those, then you can really create some magical things. So thanks very much.